Good day, Professor Joseph Drew here from the University of Technology, Sydney. Today I'm here to talk to you about the implementation of the Rates Harmonisation Program that is set to be adopted by Council. Now, Rates Harmonisation is a direct consequence of amalgamation. When two councils are amalgamated, they'll both have different rate structures, different categories, subcategories, base rates, minimum rates, different actual tax rates on the dollar of land value. They have to be harmonised. Your one council now, called Kudamundra Gundagai, you all, each person that uses the land in a particular way needs to be paying the same tax rate as anyone else using their land in that way. Now previously I had a video out here talking about the the moral defensibility of an unimproved land tax. What I was trying to do with this rates harmonisation was to give you a structure that was defensible, morally defensible, simple, accountable and transparent. You should be able to quickly understand the tax rates that are paid by different categories and why they are the way they are. It needs to be competitive. People shouldn't be not opening businesses or not moving into Kudamundra Gundagai because of a high tax rate. And I'll show you later on that your tax rate at Kudamundra Gundagai will remain lower than compatible councils. We needed to be mindful of people's capacity to pay, but the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, a local government does not know your wealth or your income. It does not have access to information. So we have no accurate way of knowing your capacity to pay. Moreover, the whole idea of the unimproved land tax, remember, is to claw back some of the unearned wealth that accrued to you because of what the community has been doing, to claw back some of that unrealised capital gain and give it back to the community so they can continue to grow, which will continue to produce wealth for you in the future. Remember, it's on unimproved land value, so it's not the um, consequences of your building, your house, landscaping or whatever it's just the value of your land why has it gone up it's gone up because of things that your community has been doing and we needed to be mindful of minimizing rate shock but i'm afraid and i'm very sad to say at the end of the day with so many subcategories with such huge differences in the tax rates paid by different subcategories and paid by the different councils prior to amalgamation and also because we've got new land valuations coming in this year as well rate shocks are inev inevitable some people will have significant increases to their rates compared to last year it's just mathematically impossible to avoid that i use a very complex algorithm called linear program with some certain constraints in there to make sure it was fair and the outcomes i will show you in a few minutes are the best that are humanly possible Member with a land tax, it's a responsibility of membership to a community, same as your federal income tax is your responsibility as a member of the community of Australia, your land tax is your responsibility as a member of the community of Kutamundra Gundagai Regional Council. It is not a fee for service, land tax has nothing to do with the services you receive and should not have anything to do with it. Services that you receive should be paid through fees and charges on the whole. The other thing to note is even if you have precisely the same tax rate throughout the local government area, people will pay different amounts of tax dollars because their lands value differently. Now generally what occurs is that land that is further away from town, that doesn't have bitumen roads, don't, doesn't have town water or power or sewer services, that land is usually valued much, much lower than land that is close to town that has all those things. That's what economists refer to as capitalising the value of services into the land value. So what that means is that we can set a constant tax rate for everyone, yet their rate bill will reflect quite closely their access to services in any case. It's, as I say, you, we all must remember always that this land tax is about returning some unearned wealth. You didn't do anything personally to make your land value go up in price, your unimproved land value go up in price. It's unearned wealth created by the community and you're trying to return it back to the community so it can continue to grow, which will create more wealth for you in the future. 
Then tax theory rejects subcategories. The whole idea of subcategories is people say, oh, well, these people get less services because they're further out of town, therefore they should pay a lower tax rate. No, sorry, that's completely incorrect. They should pay the same tax rate and the fact that the land will be worth, uh, valued at relatively less because of the less access to services will mean that they'll pay the less dollars of tax than a comparable person living close to town. Subcategories essentially provide a second discount to people in outlying area. The discount's already imputed because the land value is less because they have less access to services. To provide them with another discount on top of that simply is double dipping. Minimum rates, land tax theory would reject it. Apart from being extremely complex to implement and hard for people to understand, it essentially means that people whose land value went up by relatively less than other people in the local government area will pay relatively more land tax. I.e., another way of saying it, people with relatively less wealth in their land will subsidise people who have relatively more wealth invested in their land. And that clearly is unjust. The legislation allows you to have reduced rates for vacant land, but people who have vacant land are usually speculating. They're doing it as a business to, to sell it later and make a profit. Why would a local government want to contribute to greater profits for a speculator? It's, it's just a, a silly idea. Special rates, they had them in the past in Gundagai. I reject them. Special rates essentially says this group of people are receiving a special service therefore we'll charge them an extra special rate. It's founded on the misapprehension that rates have something to do with services. Rates are not a fee for service, therefore special rates are not theoretically um, valid. Base rates. Base rates, if done well, are morally defensible. A base rate really should reflect your basic cost of membership to the community. It should be an equal portion paid by every rate payer of the absolute basic cost to have a local government. What are those costs? The cost to have your councillors, the cost to have your elections, the cost to have your financial statements prepared and ordered, the depreciation on key buildings and the wages of key staff. It's essentially the cost to have a local government if the local government did no work. And what I've done is I've worked out that cost, I've divided it by the number of taxpayers and everyone will pay the same base rate because everyone has the same need for a basic institution called local government. Harmonised rates, we must be very clear on this. The only reason we are doing this is because of the amalgamation. If there was no amalgamation in 2016 there would have been no rates harmonisation. By rights, the rates harmonisation should have been done back in 2017. It's disadvantaged a lot of people because it wasn't done back then. And it wasn't done back then because the state government introduced some legislation which prevented local governments from, for, from doing harm, rates harmonisation for a period of three years. That period has expired now. It's time to harmonise rates. Now, the reason that legislation was in there is because Local government amalgamation inevitably results in winners and losers. I said it before, the amalgamations, other people said it as well. Now, the legislation stopped you from knowing whether you were a winner or a loser until now. Now we're unveiling whether you personally were a winner from the amalgamation or whether you personally were from a loser from the amalgamation. Harmonisation of rates is implied by the fact that they made legislation in the first place preventing it for three years. If they hadn't expected it to happen, you wouldn't have had the rate free freeze legislation in the first place. It's required by natural justice. You can't have people in the same community paying different tax rates. We wouldn't accept it with our income tax. Why would we accept it without local government taxes? It's mathematically impossible to avoid rate shock. I use a very sophisticated mathematical technique. This is the best answer possible. And if you're unhappy with the answer, if you're one of the losers, you have my sincere apologies. 
but the blame must fall on the amalgamation, whoever you blame for the amalgamation occurring, not on the staff, not on your current counsellors. The other reason why you might have some shock is because of these new land valuations. Once again, that's entirely outside of the control of council. These land valuations are done by the Valuer General. We must implement the new land valuations whether we like it or not. What I propose here is completely morally defensible. I'm not sure it was always morally defensible what we have in the past. And it's also sustainable. So, as I said, I calculated a base rate and then I worked out what's called an ad valorem. It's dollars in the dollar value of land, or sometimes it's presented as cents in the thousand dollar value of land. It's essentially your tax rate. And you will be able to see quite clearly the tax rate paid by different types of citizens in Kudamundra Gundagai in a minute when I show you. So this is what we had previously. Um, based on the new land values, if we continue the um, current system for another year, this is what we would have. As you can see, there's many, many different base rates. Base rate 187, but here's a base rate of 241. Here's a minimum rate of 551. There's a minimum rate of 442. It's hard to justify why you would have different bases and minimums. And here's your tax rates, ad valorem rates. And you'll notice that there were huge differences. Perhaps one of the bigger differences was between the residential Kudamundra people in town and the residential Kudamundra in the outskirts. 0 0.01 for in town, 0 0.002, five times less for people living in residential, same type of land use, in the outskirts. There was also this curious thing here with business too. We had a business tax rate for CBD that of 0 0.028, we had non-CBD half as much. The land was being used for the same purposes. It's hard to understand why. This one's particularly interesting. Four different types of industrial land, business industrial aerodrome, industrial barn street, industrial east, industrial south, all with very different tax rates. One had a tax rate of 0 0.0146, Another one had a tax rate of 0 0.0133. Why? They were all industrial. What's happened over time, in, in fairness, is these things were implemented many, many years ago, and because of the rate capping, the compounding effect of that, over to, and new land valuations and subdivisions, over time those tax rates that might have been set close to equal originally, slowly stretch further and further apart from each other. You can also see the tax rates between the different local governments were quite different. So farmland in Kudamundra was paying 0 0.0029, but farmland in uh, sorry in Gundagai was paying 0 0.0029, but farmland in Kudamundra was paying 0 0.00178, much lower rate of tax. Land was being used for the same purposes. You're now one council, you should be paying one tax rate if you're using your land for a particular purpose. So we're going from this great big messy thing to a much simpler rate structure that we can all understand and grasp pretty quickly. So three, three categories required by law under the Local Government Act 1993, residential, farm, business. I'm required to do that by law. A base rate which is precisely the same for each category because you all have the same need for a local government. And this covers the basic fundamental cost of having a local government even if it did nothing. And then here's your tax rate, the ad valorem. Now you'll notice that the tax rates are different. Ideally those tax rates would be almost identical. It can't be done at the moment because there were such huge differences previously within councils and between the two councils. It just couldn't be done to have the tax rates the same without crushing certain industries, particularly farmland businesses. Now I have a plan over time that I presented to council to slowly increase the tax rate for the farmland up to the residential rate and slowly decrease in real time terms the tax rate for businesses down to the, far, uh, to the residential rate. So how that would work is, as you may or may not know, there's a rate cap every year. The state government tells us how many percent we can put the total tax take up by. In this case it was 2.6%. What I'm proposing is instead of putting each category up by 2.6%, 
we would instead put one category, the lowest rate taxpayer category, the farmland, up by 4%. We would put the residential up by 1.3%. And the business wouldn't tax rate wouldn't be increased at all. It would go up by 0%. What that will mean is slowly business rates will come effectively down in real terms, slowly farm rates will come up, and residential rates will marginally go down over time. Now if we do that over many, many years, decades, we will end up eventually with a tax system where each category is essentially paying the same rate of taxation. And that's the fairest outcome slightly more for farms and businesses because they can claim their rates as a tax deduction which most residential people can't do. But that will take many years to do in a sustainable way. We can't crush the farm sector. We all rely on it directly or indirectly. It's the base of, you, of your economy in your, in your local government area. Businesses rely on the farmers and residents rely on the business. So we can't destroy a sector. Popping the farm rates up by about 4% every year is sustainable and sensible and doable and copable for the farmers um, and we will over time eventually end up with a much more equitable tax system. Now what's the effect on rate payers? I've given you some what we call summary statistics here. The mean is the average. We all know what an average is. Sum up all the numbers and divide it by the number of numbers. It gives you a pretty good idea of what the typical person is going to face. The median is what you would get if you put all the numbers in ascending order and picked out the middle number. The quartile is the median of the first half, and the quartile one, and the quartile three is the median of the second half. Another way of thinking about quartile one is 25% of ratepayers will have increases or decreases greater than that. For quartile three, 25% of ratepayers will have increases greater than quartile three. 50% of the ratepayers will sit between quartile one and quartile three, i.e. most people this will be the, the range of the changes they'll cop. Unfortunately some ratepayers do have very high changes. Now often that's because of the land valuations that have changed dramatically, but sometimes it's because some of these ratepayers were in subcategories that were getting extraordinary discounts. So I will give you some specific examples in a minute, but there was a subcategory that was essentially getting a 78% discount on their tax rate compared to other residential taxpayers. Well, if we want to be fair and have everyone pay the same rate of tax, which is reasonable, because remember what we're trying to do is get the same proportion of unearned wealth back off you. Well, if we want to be reasonable, well, those people who were getting those amazing discounts previously are going to have a big shock, a big rate shock. And some people will be winners, as I said. Someone has their rates reduced by 48% and they will be very happy. Okay, so if we look at a thing called a standard normal distribution, normal symmetrical distribution, you can see that 25% of rate payers will fall under Q1, quartile 1. 50% of rate payers will be between quartile 1 and quartile 3. Quartile 2 will be where the average is. And 25% of rate payers will be above quartile 3. If the distribution is a bit skewed, which they often are with land prices, we will might likely get something like this where the median and the mean don't match precisely on each other. But for the purposes of the understanding, I think most of us are more comfortable with discussing the mean or the average. Okay, so if we look back at residential, the typical taxpayer is going to have their rates go up by 9.8%. Now we must remember that there was a rate cap anyway. So a rate cap in place any, anyway for every year. So in any case, rates were going up by 2.6% because that's what the New South Wales state government said that local governments could put their rates up by. So bear that in mind when you're looking at that statistic that 2.6% of that 9.8 is the rate cap anyway. Um, we're going to find that um, most people are going to sit in this range of having reduced rates compared to last year of almost 11% up to around almost 15% higher than last year. So these are relative to what you paid last year. 
If we look at a specific example, it makes it a little bit easier to understand what's happening. So I've took a real property of our models, real data, this is a real person. I've de-identified it by putting a whole string of X's here so you don't know the property number. It was in a residential subcategory, one of these subcategories that we're getting a 78% discount on their rates, taxes previously. Now this particular property was worth $178,000, it's unimproved land value in 2016. In 2019, the Auditor Valuer General tells us that the unimproved land value is now 245000 Now, clearly by subtracting those two numbers, we can see that this person has accrued an extra $67,000 in wealth over three years simply because of their unimproved land went up in value because of what the community has been doing. That means this person is $67,000 better off than what they were three years ago. Now previously their rates was $781 almost and under the proposal their rates will now be $1581. A lot more. I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that it's going to cause pain but it's completely unavoidable if we're going to have a morally defensible system. Now what we're essentially saying is we're asking this person to pay an extra $800 in rates than what they previously did. That sounds terrible and it, it will cause harm, I, I acknowledge this, but we need to put this in perspective. This person in the last three years has had generated for them by the community an extra $67,000 in wealth. From that $67,000 in wealth, we're asking them to pay an extra $800. When you consider it in those terms, it's not a bad deal at all. And we need to be mindful of what an unimproved land tax is really trying to do. It's trying to claw back a little bit of this 67000 a tiny sliver of that $67,000. It's trying to claw it back and give it to, back to the community that created the wealth for this person. Let's have a look at farmland. It's more extreme for the farmland than the business, and the business. The typical farmer is going to find their rates going up by almost 20%. They're the lowest rate of taxation as you saw in the overview before but they almost all farmland taxpayers have had their rates go up enormously quartile one is minus three percent so the rates have gone down by three percent hardly noticeable quartile three is 41 percent they've gone up by so 50 percent of farmers most of the farmers are going to have their rates change from three percent less through to 41% more. A lot of rate shock in the farmland category. The highest change is going to be 206%. That's the biggest loser in terms of what happened with the amalgamation. The biggest winner from the amalgamations is the person whose rate goes down almost 49%. So let's look at a specific example again. This particular person in 2016, their land was worth 68 grand almost. 2019, the value of general tells us their land is now worth 201000 That person has had an additional $133,000 of wealth effectively drop out the sky into their lap. They're $133,000 better off through nothing that they've physically done themselves. Now previously their rates was $332, which was, seems very low. They're now being asked to pay a rate of $752 almost. That's gone up by almost $420, or 126%. The percentage sounds terrible, but when you look at the dollar amount, $420, it's not so bad. I acknowledge it will cause hurt for this particular person, but this person needs to consider their extra rates they've been asked to pay in terms of the extra wealth they've received from the community. So from the $133,000 of extra wealth that this person's received over the last three years, we're asking them to pay an extra $420 in rates essentially. Which once again, in those terms, it doesn't seem like a very big ask. Look at the businesses. Your typical business is gonna go up 20%. Now in the case of businesses, it's, once again, it's about those subcategories. We had lots of subcategories for businesses, four for the industrial, and then business outside the CDD and business inside the CBD and business other. Some of those businesses were getting incredible tax discounts. 
So one of the categories, the category that the example comes from in a minute, was paying one eighth of the tax rate as their peers doing the same business operations who happen to be sitting in the CBD. So they were effectively getting a 90% discount on their taxes previously. Well, obviously their taxes are going to increase a lot under a morally defensible fair tax system. So the typical business is going up 19%, but the ranges are quite interesting here. Q1 is going to see, quarter one is going to see reductions in the order of about 27%. 27% reduction to their rates. Quartile 3 is going to see an increase in their rates from about 32%. So the majority of people are going to see their rates change from last year from either going down by about 26% all the way through to going up by 32%. There's one particular loser. Their rates will be going up 10 times. That's mostly because in this particular instance, and the person will know who they are and they'll accept the story, their land value went up by almost 10 times, just over 10 times, I think. So it's hardly surprising their rates went up. They had an awful lot of unearned wealth created for them. And then there's some lucky rate payers, mainly in the CBD of Cootamundra, whose rates have gone down because previously they were effectively subsidising other types of businesses that weren't in the CBD. So looking at a specific example again, this particular property, Previously, it was only worth 21 grand. It's obviously out of town. It was getting that substantial, huge tax discount previously of around 90%. Previously, in 2016, the land was worth 21 grand. Now, the value of general tells us it's worth 33 grand. They've had almost $12,000 of unearned wealth descend on them from by virtue of what the community has been doing. They previously paid exceptionally low rates of $300 a year. We're now asking them to pay the same tax rate as everyone else in the combined local government area of seven, which works out for on their land value is $727. We're asking them to pay an extra $420 a year. Doesn't sound terrible in dollar terms. In percentage terms, it looks horrid, an extra 140%. But let's put it in perspective again. This business previously was getting a 90% discount on their taxes. They can think about how sad it is that their rates are going up now, or they can think about how lucky they've been for the last few decades. They've been paying one-eighth of the rate of taxation as other businesses in their local government area. They've been getting an exceptionally good deal for a long time. Furthermore, they've had $12,000 of wealth created for, for them by the community. And the community in return is asking them to pay an extra $400 per year in rates. When you consider it in that, in those terms, asking someone who got $12,000 of extra wealth created through no effort of their own to hand back just $400 of it, it's not such a bad deal. So we need to look at comparison of other councils. You may be aware the Office of Local Government categorizes councils and you're in OLG 11 category over here as Cootamundra Gundagai Council. So if we compare your average rates proposal to the average rate of similar councils, we find that in all instances, the average rates at Kutamundra Gundagai are far less than the average rates in similar councils. So the average residential rate in Kutamundra Gundagai is around 700 bucks. In other OLG councils, you'd be paying $806 on average. Farmland, $3,000 roughly. In other OLG 11 councils, you'd be asked to pay $3,300. In business, being asked to pay $1,640 on average. In other typical similar councils, you'd be asked to pay $2,100 roughly. So the rates have gone up a lot. I'm very sorry for it. Remember, it was completely unavoidable. This is the best scenario that was mathematically, humanly possible. Remember that this rates harmonization has only occurred because of the amalgamation. If you are not happy with the outcome, you need to blame whoever you feel is responsible for the amalgamation. It's not something your councillors did to you. It's not something your council staff did to you. It's not something I did to you. If you've got rate shock, there's two big causes. The, the biggest cause is the rates harmonization that results from the amalgamation. So the main reason you're getting shock is the 2016 amalgamation. Up until now, you've 
you've had it hidden from you whether you're a winner or a loser I've now unveiled to you whether you're a winner or a loser the other cause of your rate shock of course is the land valuation which is also completely outside of the control of local government okay thank you very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you all in a week or so when I come down to the community consultation about the boundaries commission proposal thank you goodbye